Now you're very welcome back to the show. Jordan Henderson this afternoon finally completing his £30 million move to Saudi Pro League club El Adafak. He's going to be playing under Stephen Gerrard, who he played alongside for three of his 12 seasons at Liverpool. Henderson will reportedly be signing a contract worth around £700,000 a week. He's been heavily criticised by LGBT plus community groups in the UK, including Cop Outs, who are Liverpool's own LGBT group. Uh, they have been very damning in their comments this afternoon afternoon saying given the choices that Jordan Henderson has made cop outs doubt and question if Henderson was ever an actual ally of the community we're also going to have a chat about uh, Harry Kane's situation at Spurs at the moment delighted to say that Martin Lipton is with us Martin how are you getting on I'm pretty well, thanks, yeah. Um, if we could start with Henderson, I mean, this has been in the offing for a little while and we saw the videos during the week of him uh, coming back from the Germany camp with Liverpool and then eventually going to Croatia uh, to link up with El Adifak, and now the deal has gone through. He is facing considerable criticism. I mentioned cop-outs comments this afternoon. Uh, Thomas Hitzelberger, who's an open former gay footballer that uh, people will remember playing in the Premier League as well, has been very critical today. Um, it's fair to say he's facing a, a fair old backlash before he begins at his new club absolutely i think hilsberger's comments were the most damning in many ways uh, in you know dismissing his pre- basically said you know all the things he claimed before were not true uh i, I dismissed them well i mean that's a, a brave and a, a strong stance i think that henderson would have known that this would um be a decision that would be heavily controversial and and so it's it's proven and i don't know whether any of us, though, could look at the prospect of £700,000 a year tax-free and not be tempted. I think even even I might be. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready to go to the VAD Express. No, that's not true. For, for, for a considerable amount. Uh, and therein lies the issue. The money that they're throwing at people is so huge that even the most stoic may think again. I mean, we had Andy Murray in tennis the other week admitting that despite all of his previous comments... If the ATP tour went to to Saudi, he'd probably play. Um, it's it's unfortunately perhaps, but it's the reality of the world. I think in Henderson's case, it's going to be a tougher sell just because of the stance he took, uh, particularly uh, uh, on these issues, on gay rights uh, and other uh, you know minority groups needing protection. He's been vocal in his support and. I can understand why some would see somewhat betrayed by him. Yeah, I mean, this, it's one of those transfers as well, Martin. When you look at the video that Alifak put out this afternoon, they literally put a greyed out square over the rainbow armband, which would have been worn for much of the season by Jordan Henderson last year. It's not even subtle. No, it's not. I mean, it, what was, what's interesting, I remember in the, in the World Cup where we had the ban on the, um, the rainbow or the, you know, the One Love armband, and yet I could walk through the metro station nearest to the World Cup media centre and Harry Kane and Virgil van Dijk had massive posters wearing that armband. Uh, so it seemed a bit bizarre. Clearly, though, the Saudis is a very different cup of tea to even Qatar. Um, their stance on a number of issues is far more punitive, um, some would say far more medieval. Uh, and I think it necessarily means that the just criticism that falls upon Henderson because of the positions he's taken here to four will be, will be all the greater. You do not go to Saudi Arabia with your eyes shut unless you're deliberately not seeing. He must know, because he's not a fool, what he's agreed to be part of. It is an incredibly difficult one to square off for Henderson, and that's a personal thing for him. As you say, when he has been such a strong advocate of these views, particularly in the last two to three seasons, I think it's been very clear with Henderson, and very very publicly as Liverpool captain too, uh, for him to now be in a position where he has spoken many times about his support for friends of his who are in the LGBT community, and the reality is that if you're homosexual and in Saudi Arabia right now, that's illegal. It's against the law. And it's as simple as that. And Henderson must now square his previous stance, this is from a personal perspective, with the decision he has taken. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad decision or a wrong decision. I have some doubts about the, the decision myself, but I can understand why he do it. But clearly he must be willing to accept the criticism that's going to come 
and find a way of dealing with it because it will not go away, I don't think, for some time. On a practical level, it probably means the end of his England career, I would think. I, I wouldn't imagine that Gareth Southgate will be selecting him while he's playing in Saudi Arabia, but maybe that was already moving in that direction in the last year or so anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think he likes him in the squad. He wasn't... I don't think he'd have been a starter for the Euros. You know, the starting duo, if they play two in midfield, it could be Bellingham and Vice, and you play others around them. Uh, you've still got Phillips and you've got Mount, etc. Et so it isn't as if England are desperately short of midfield players. Uh, even um, Alexander Arnold's a midfielder player now, we, we're told, aren't we? So there you go. Uh, so I think it was it, he was going to be drawing a veil over his international career in any event over the, the coming season. I think he may have stayed through the qualifying campaign, but I couldn't really see him in the squad for the finals. Uh, but this will confirm it because you can't play at that level of football and expect to play at the very highest level uh, overnight. You, it's, it's not viable and it's not possible. So... His England career, I think, is effectively over now. I wonder for Jurgen Klopp whether he would have preferred to have kept Henderson around. He was um, speaking today quite glowingly about the job that Henderson did in his midfield and he harkened back to that midfield that won the Champions League. That midfield is now very much deconstructed and being rebuilt at the moment. Uh, but given the work that's been required and Liverpool have already made a couple of signings in midfield, I wonder if Klopp would have preferred to have kept Henderson's experience around for the next couple of seasons, even if it was maybe in a different role and one coming off the bench. I think he'd have certainly wanted to have him here for this season. With Fabinho going, we've already lost Oxlade Chamberlain. Firmino's gone. Sane obviously went, uh, so Mane rather, obviously went a year ago. There's quite a lot of experience gone from that dressing room, which means that there's a lot of owners on young kids. And sometimes they need to be able to look to a, an older head to, to guide them and keep them calm. And that is a role that he fulfilled extremely well uh, for club and country over the last few years because of his experience. I think he's a big miss in the dressing room and in the squad, even if he might not necessarily be as big a miss on the pitch. And it'll feel like a big coup for Steven Gerrard, I would think, because there's some very interesting players going to Saudi Arabia right now. Marco Verratti is being heavily linked with a move from PSG. Brozovic has gone from Inter. And these players moving, and I know Henderson is a little bit older than them, but compared to, say, Benzema and Ronaldo, who are clearly on their last ever contract, there are some players who will feel they've got plenty of football left in them still going to Saudi Arabia. And for Steven Gerrard to have got Liverpool's captain to sign for them must feel like somewhat of a coup for him, I would think. No, absolutely. It's a huge one for him. He'll be very pleased indeed with it. And I'm sure that there'll be others being tempted. I think when you start seeing players going in their mid-20s, it's a real concern. Players in their mid-30s is a, a mild concern. Players in their late 30s, you don't really worry too much about. So Henderson's in that sort of second bracket. Uh, but there's going to be some more going at younger players. And that's when there'll be a massive concern, I think, for... For European football, if players who are in their prime attempted. At this stage, that doesn't seem to be happening apart from one or two, but I think it's a, a direction that may well be, be looked at. And also, if you are Liverpool and if you're Klopp, you must be starting to wonder when they're going to make a bid for Mo Salah. Mm. Because he's the obvious Arabic speaking player who you would imagine the Saudis would want as the marquee player in their league the moment Cristiano Ronaldo quits. And that's what makes Henderson feel incredibly different with the reach of the Saudi Pro League right now, where you have a player for everything we spoke about over the last five or six minutes with his views around society and around football. He has been tempted to go to Saudi Arabia. For the best part, we have been looking at players who maybe have religious ties, players who are coming right to the very end of their career and where this is an entirely money-based move. Henderson feels like something slightly different here. Yeah, I, I suspect he may end up living in Bahrain, which is slightly uh, looser, because it's, I think that's where relatively close to where this team is, is based, just across the border, and he can just hop across. And I think that's the most likely scenario for him, because even if he's not a big drinker, and I don't think he is, living in such a particular state might be quite difficult for European players, um, particularly when he sees the way that women are treated very differently to to over here. And we obviously discussed the, the, the LGBT scenario as well, but it's more than that. It's a completely different uh, cast of mind in those more uh, strongly religious Gulf, Gulf states. And it, I, I think this is going to be really, very really interesting to see how players 
who are used to a much more liberal regime get their heads around it. Now, a few years ago, we had this expansion in China and we thought there'd be loads of players going to, to China to play. And indeed, they did. But they only lasted 18 months. And the issue again here is, is this a long-term thing or is it a short-term money earning exercise and that people might soon turn their backs on because of what they're actually encountering in the reality as opposed to being sold a, a vision of playing football and earning this money. But living somewhere is different. You know, we've had foreign players who couldn't stand the weather in Manchester. Mm. Um, don't blame them for that. As someone who used to live in Huddersfield. Uh, it's, uh, you, you know, and, and find London too cold and too strange and too difficult. Uh, and as a London, I find London too cold and strange and difficult at times as well. So moving to parts of Saudi Arabia will be a, a, a such a huge cultural difference that they might find it hard. In theory, though, the Saudi League should be here potentially for longer than China, purely because when I look at the PIF essentially buying the four biggest clubs within the league and guaranteeing the bankroll around the signings that they're making currently, given that they have put money into Newcastle United, given they have put big money into the world scene on golf and effectively have brought the leagues together into one organisation, whether they call it a merger or not, when it comes to Live Golf and the PGA Tour. The feeling seems to be that this is a longer term investment than China felt like, where China was almost, uh, here's money we're going to throw at the market right now at a bit of making something happen. This looks like it's a slightly more long term project, on the face of it at least. I think so, yes. Look, it's quite clear that uh, the term sports washing has been used. This is it on a grand scale. And that's not a criticism. It's a way of making Saudi Arabia a more marketable, popular, even a tourist destination. That is that is the aim. I mean, they're looking to hold the Winter Olympics in a country that's made basically desert. Uh, there, there is no end, it seems, to their global sporting ambitions across a variety of of sports, they have the money, they have the resources, they have the determination and drive, they have the ambition. And because of that, and particularly because of the first of those, the money, open mouth sport will say, yes, please feed me. That's unfortunately the world we're in. Harry Kane won't be moving to Saudi Arabia, but we don't think so. No, um, <laughs> that would be that would be quite the turn up for the books. I think this would be up with Mbappe if uh, a Saudi club were to put a bid in for Harry Kane that would be successful. But Tottenham are in that awkward situation at the moment, Martin, where you either convince Harry Kane at this stage to put pen to paper, or these offers that come in from Bayern Munich will become more and more difficult to turn down. It looks that way, doesn't it? I mean, I feel for the first time now that it's more likely than not that he's going to go. But that doesn't mean he will. And unless Munich come in with a bid that's sufficient, there's no way he goes. I mean, Levy can't sell him. Spurs can't sell him to another Premier League club. So it's either Bayern, PSG or nowhere, it would seem. But Bayern are trying to lowball with offers. And I think the stunt with the laddie with the shirt from Bilt went down like a bucket of cold sick, in truth. Uh, that's the sort of thing that doesn't play well. Um, some of the things have been said by Bayern Munich seem designed to try to in, to force Daniel Levy to never sell because he's going to get more intransigent when these things happen. And there is this potential belief, I think, that actually they may have a really good manager now and it might be the project that, that turns things around and maybe if they're doing very, very well next season and Kane sees that actually it's worth it, that he, he might want to stay, but it's a huge gamble in case it doesn't work like that and they're eighth again or, or worse. I don't think they will be worse, but you never know. Um, the one thing I would say is if he was to go next season, in fact, if he goes this season, there isn't a Spurs fan who'll begrudge him going mm. because he's been fantastic for the club. If he were to go next season, likewise, he would go with all the best wishes of the Tottenham supporters as long as he didn't go to Chelsea or Arsenal. I don't think he'd do either of those. But I genuinely think he, in his ideal world, he would win something with Spurs and not go. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult if you're a Harry Kane right now for that very reason. And Postacoglu comes in, maybe things go well, you get into the middle of the season then and you're effectively walking into free agency. So he's either getting an incredible last contract with Tottenham Hotspur or he walks on a free and goes wherever he wants. Daniel Levy tends to be a man who's incredibly practical. But I'm sure he is more than willing to sit back and go, if this reported uh, selling price is £100 million, 
I don't get the feeling that Danny Levy will say, all right, we'll let him go for 80. No, it's not in his nature, I don't think. And also, getting into the Champions League is worth, a conservative guess, 70 million. Mm. Keeping Kane for one season gives him a far greater chance of earning that 70 million because he's going to score goals. And I suspect, actually, under Postacoglu, he maybe even score more goals if he stays fit than he did this season. He scored 30 this season in the Premier League because they're going to create more chances because of the way they play. Um, and it's also nigh on impossible to replace Kane with one player because of what he does. Now, it doesn't mean you can't... No one's irreplaceable. And at some point, he will move on because he retires, even if he stays. You know, that's the nature of football. But how do you replace Kane in the short term? I mean, you've got three weeks to the start of the season, five weeks to the window shutting. Who do you get in? You know, you might want to get... Might have, four months ago, you might say, oh, well, maybe we'll get Ivan Tony, but he can't play till January. Mm. So where do you go? Are you going to get a guarantee of goals out of the 60 million Brazilian who scored one goal in the Premier League last season? No, I think he'll score more goals this season, Richarlison. And I think actually he's possibly more suited to... Game. Yeah. But he's never going to score 30, is he? No. I think as well, if 100 million is in the bank, that late in the window, because if you're Bayern Munich and you're playing it the way they are right now, you probably wait until as close to the window as possible, play a game of chicken with Daniel Levy and see if he'll sell at some point. But if Tottenham were to receive the money for Daniel for Harry Kane quite late in the window, it becomes very difficult to buy somebody in this market, which is inflated with some of the fees that are going around currently anyway, if the clubs who you're looking to buy from know you've got £100 million in your back pocket as well. I, I, look, this may look really stupid in 10 days' time, but... I suspect that if Kane plays the Shakhtar the next Fenley on the 6th of August, unless he plays and it's clearly a farewell because of his actions at the end of the match, that he will still be at Tottenham on September 2. OK. That's my suspicion because Postacoglu cannot have his season disrupted before it's kicked off any more than it has been. It's not been easy for him. You've had the Kane thing going on in the background. You've had one of the games cancelled because of the rain in Thailand. And then we've got the other thing, which we're going to go on, I'm sure, fairly soon, now floating around in the background. He needs clarity. And he needs Daniel to say, right, he's not going. Or we're selling. Well, the last thing he needs is, well, we'll see. That's no good to anyone. To cost Costa Coglu, to Tottenham, to Kane, to the squad. Then that, it has to be done, I think, over the next 10 days, one way or the other. The other thing you refer to is Joe Lewis's current situation. So the latest we have is that he has now handed himself into authorities in New York. He's been accused of insider trading over the years and he's facing those charges in the US. But based on some of the reports, Martin, that we've seen, uh, particularly I read one in The Telegraph earlier today where they were effectively saying that Joe Lewis is the owner of Tottenham Hotspur really in name only, that he has no day-to-day -day running of the club. And so therefore, even if Joe Lewis was to end up in jail for the rest of his life, this is unlikely to have a practical implication on Tottenham. I agree with that, actually, other than a potential sale of the club because he needs to raise money. He's never been in day-to-day -day control of the club. From the moment he bought it, the club's been run day-to-day -day by Daniel Levy. That's 22 years. He was just the money man initially. And it is a fact, according to Companies House, that on October the 5th, he ceded control of the shares that were in his name through Enic to two of his associates and happened to work for Tavistock and other companies in the Bahamas, but nevertheless... So he has no formal legal role in the ownership of the club. And financially, the club is bankrolled not by Joe Lewis. The club is bankrolled financially by the income from the Premier League and the gate receipts at £6 million per home game from the stadium and the commercial deals that have been done by Daniel and others at the club and the revenue of half a billion pounds plus per year at Tottenham. None of that comes from Joe Lewis. It all comes from the revenue from the club. The argument from many Spurs fans is why hasn't he spent any money? Mm. Not that he's spending too much money. So it will have no 
immediate effect in that regard. I mean, the question is whether they need to borrow money, where they get it from, have they exhausted the credit line? But the, the interest they're paying on the stadium debt is only 17 million a year, which isn't a lot when you look at uh, wages to revenue ratio of 50 or percent, the lowest in the Premier League of, of any of the big clubs, in fact, the lowest in the Premier League. Um, but I do think that even if he's not the owner, we know that he has a significant role in terms of the where the shares ended up. And I do suspect now that there is a possibility there's more chance of a sale at a lower price than might have been the case before. You just got to find someone coming in with that bid. But I think they wanted three and a half billion before. And I suspect that if someone came in with two and a half billion now, they might be more amenable to listening to that offer. Yeah, I think it would really test their resolve. And we remember back to last year where the reports were circling around about delegates from Qatar meeting Tottenham in London and the possibility of that being an investment into the club or if not a full takeover, that's what they were looking at potentially doing. We're also in a market at the moment, Martin, where I think a lot of uh, Premier League owners are probably very aware of what clubs are worth when they see what the Glazers are trying to do at Manchester United at the moment and the Newcastle sale having gone through just over a year ago as well. There's a fair amount of information about people who are looking at football clubs right now. Absolutely. Now, um, one thing that strikes me is the initial thought from PSG or from the Qataris about uh, about their investment was to take a, a small stake in, in Tottenham. But given what's happening in the Ligue 1, if you're Nasser Al-Khalifi, might it not be smarter long-term investment to reduce the stake in PSG and make a full bid for Tottenham? I don't know. But it's a bigger market to operate in. The the revenues are going to be larger. The potential upside is greater. And it might make more sense. I'm not saying that's going to happen at all because initially the talk was about taking a small stake. Mm. But I do think there's a chance of that. We know there have been others who have looked and discussed about a possible... Uh, involvement at, at Tottenham. I think the problem has been the asking price has been viewed as too great. But maybe that changes now. Maybe if there's a need to get more cash quickly, you may be more willing to, to listen to that. The problem you have is that Daniel Levy, would, if he has to sell, would rather sell and remain chief exec, which I can't actually see happening. But there you go. It's a bit like um, Everton and... Um, their owner, yeah. who thinks that he can he can stay even if he sells or has done that, so it doesn't really doesn't really work, does it? But let, let's see how it uh, how it pans out. I do think we're into a, a period where Tottenham's long term ownership is more in question, or medium term actually ownership is more in question now than before. Probably, I would say, as questionable as it's been since Alan Sugar left the club at this point. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we get into that point now where. There's not much more Levy can do except win a trophy. He's built the ground. It's magnificent. He's built the training ground. He has planning consent for other work around the ground. And maybe you'd end up with a deal where the club goes for a certain amount, but the ground, the, the, the things, the ancillary stuff around the ground remains in the hands of, of Enic. I don't know. And it's a different deal that needs to be done for the profit from the rights that they've got with them. Um, planning permission for that that land I don't know I'm just floating that as a concept Interesting to see what happens over the next while Martin Lipton it's been a pleasure thanks a million for joining us Thanks a lot Cheers